We've had a very full two days of discussion. Our plan in this final session is to invite the moderators from uh, the several sessions through the days to offer their perspectives, uh, summarizing and perhaps uh, adding uh, from their perspective uh, points that were raised in each of the sessions. I do want to allow then an opportunity particularly for uh, our friends from the NIH and NSABB uh, for whom in effect we are gathering ideas and assembling these thoughts. Uh, if there are any issues or topics or questions uh, that they would like to raise and invite further comment from uh, those of us who are here in the uh, program today and in the audience. Uh, and uh, then we'll open uh, the microphones for additional uh, comments, suggestions, ideas uh, that anyone present and uh, from the web would like to uh, include in the record. So that's our plan. I'm going to launch uh, right in, uh, in order. I'm going to turn first, therefore, to you, Chuck, uh, Chuck Haas, okay. for the overview on the policy framework and key questions. Okay, uh, next slide. So I want to give some big picture uh, summaries of my takeaways with one, one editorial comment. So data gaps, particularly on laboratory safety, were thought to limit ability to do an absolute risk assessment. Um, and we had, I think, a good set of questions from the floor about the need to develop scholarship and support for those studies. Um, my comment is that that data is not totally absent, and it might have been informative to use whatever data is out there, even though it's poor, not exactly in the laboratories we're talking about, to bound the potential risks that could occur. If a pure risk acceptable rule is used as a decision, we lack information on what the level of acceptability should be. Um, Rocco presented an updated uh, analysis using new data on seasonal versus 1918 influenza, which raises a broader point, and that is risk assessments in general need to be living, need to be adaptable to new information as it comes along. And then finally, leaving uncertainty out, and this is Adam Finkel's direct quote, is a violation of first principles. Next slide. Um, another quote from Adam is, the statement, is it safe, is a vapid question. It, meaning it's a question intrinsically without meaning absent a reference level. A hierarchy of potential judgment rules exist. Um, both Tony Cox and Adam Finkel made that clear and the explicit judgment of what the rule is to be used needs to be made. Uh, Kara Morgan called this deciding how to decide, which seems to be missing as an explicit statement from the discussion. And stakeholder input needs to be included to develop the decision rules. The decision analysis community has rich scholarship, which needs to be brought to bear, and again, that's from Kara. Next slide. Tony called um, the fallacy of coherence. Um, and I, I use the phrase, because it has been accepted doesn't mean it's been acceptable. Um, just because risks have been accepted in the past does that mean, does not mean that an informed judgment going forward would make that same numerical risk acceptable. A useful task would be to assess whether or not a collection of more information would make a decision better. And again, there's a rich literature on the concept of value of information in this regard. Next. A couple of miscellaneous problems, um, and I think this is from Rocco. Bench researchers may not be familiar enough with epidemiological parameters to assess transmissibility. Risk-benefit analysis could be used to improve the risk profile of proposed experiments, in other words, envisioning an iterative process of some sort. Um, third bullet is from Adam. Risk and benefit analyses should be balanced, humble, and explicit about value judgments. And then finally, we had a discussion, I think, from the audience that particularly long-term benefits may be particularly difficult to value and highly uncertain. Um, my editorial comment on that is 
while this may very well be true, it shouldn't mean that you should walk away from the effort to attempt to quantify them using whatever information you have now. And I think that's my last slide. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck. Very uh, cogent and quite focused in the comments. Barry, we'll turn next to you, and if you would, I know that you're uh, going to be able to share with us some reflections based on both the session that uh, Michelle Mello uh, moderated on the U.S. landscape, as well as the one that you did on the international dimensions. Uh, thanks, Harvey, um, and I thank Michelle for uh, providing notes on her views on the policy landscape U.S. Uh, her first point is basically that there is no set of policies at the moment uh, that targets uh, the broadly um, conceivable group of pathogens uh, dis, dis, uh, defined as uh, gain of function and gain of function of concern and strongly supports um, the hope that the NSABB report will generate such a framework. Um, she's concerned that existing law doesn't really reach research that is not conducted with federal funding, and that raises questions, and there needs to be thought about uh, mechanisms by which um, that can be regulated. Um, I think an output of her panel was to recognize that the time to regulate is at, as close to the time that research is conceived and uh, ideas, the later it goes, the more difficult it is um, to deal with. Um, an issue that was raised is the general issue of liability, whether in this country it's, it's always guaranteed uh, with respect to institutional liability, but in a global context, it isn't clear that uh, there is a mechanism for uh, indemnification or liability if dreadful things happen. Uh, another point that you raised is that it would be very important for regulators, both institutional and at federal agencies, to be in consultation with scientists concerned with this uh, kind of work and um, sees a tension between the desire for transparency and the risks of publication for sensitive information and uh, a tension as well um, between the need for common standards that can be applied in a, reg in a reliable fashion and the fact that different institutions have different capacities and capabilities and individual practices, which came out clearly in her panel, and how that all may be accommodated. So those would be, I think, Michelle's comments. Um, my comments are even more simple-minded. Um, it was clear from the very beginning of the sessions on the first day that everyone involved in this meeting recognizes that science and the risks and benefits have uh, global implications and gain of function clearly has global concerns. Um, we had major presentations on the groundbreaking progress made by the European Union, which showed that it was possible to have uh, discussions and bring country policies from 28 countries uh, to a common focus together and scientific academies in almost all of those countries to a consensus on uh, scientific policies that would govern this. Um, they emphasized the need to expand and extend the discussion between countries in Europe. They'll be very interested in discussions after uh, the United States policies are formulated and are keen to find out ways in which discussion and consultation can be expanded to be inclusive of all countries. In this context, we heard um, the very important discussion of the inter-academy partnerships, a global network of science and medical academies that now links academies in 128 countries in four regions. Um, that could serve as a useful focus for extending the discussions of gain of functions um, in a coherent way uh, to responsible scientific bodies uh, that already exist and perhaps should be thought of in moving forward. The recommendation from that discussion was 
probably the best place to start is discussion within scientific communities rather than going directly to policymakers one at a time, one country at a time until there is some general understanding and agreement within the scientific community and then to simplify the complexities of those dialogues and discussions to a level that could gain understanding and support from the political leaderships. We also heard the value of not just pontificating but having uh, important um, partnerships and collaborations that enables transparency to occur, enables technology transfer to occur and training to occur, but also can be a way of maintaining standards and identifying low standards. A personal comment is in my reflection on this meeting that I've come to the view that process is probably as important as principles. It is not clear given the technicalities of the science that the lay public and even government officials are going to understand the technicalities. But if the processes at every level um, are transparent, maybe that's the best way to gain trust within the scientific community and within the public at large. At large. And that means the processes as we are conceiving it and the NSABB conceives it, is a set of tiered processes that occurs at multiple levels from the investigator, the IBC, the institutions, study sections, and all the way up to the higher levels of policy. Uh, a <coughs> second reflection on this meeting is that whatever we do, we have to recognize that science is changing dramatically so that policies really can't be fixed in time to predict what possibilities, opportunities, technologies, and threats will be coming in future so that the policies need to be flexible in some way to accommodate new knowledge and adapt to new opportunities and possibilities and yet have a clear-cut framework that people can uh, work with. And lastly, I would support uh, Gabriel Leong's comment. When you ask the question, why does the Biological Convention Treaty, as far as we know, largely work? Why do the um, Helsinki principles actually govern how human experimentation is done? I would say it's less legal liability in lawsuits than it is to ask, what are the principal constraints on scientists? And that has to do in general with constraints on reputation, credibility, integrity, respect in the scientific community. And Matt Messelson, when he was asked, how could you possibly engage one more action to uh, enforce the Biologic Weapons Convention, he raised the interesting possibility of making it not possible for scientists to travel internationally as another constraint that would be of high value for scientists. So I think enforcement at a moral level is highly possible. Very right, thank you both for your comments on the discussion and your own reflections. Uh, your notes about process, I think, are a great bridge to Baruch's session uh, on the discussion about the culture of uh, safety and uh, the public participation. So Baruch, we will turn to you. So our session was about informing policy design and how I've represented the participants. Next slide, please. I thought I would start with a bit of nomenclature. So I'm, I'm going to be using social, the term social science, for those of you who are not familiar with our part of the world, to, to include social, behavioral, and decision science. Behavioral science is what is the study of individuals, it's psychology, microeconomics, neuroscience, and, and others. Social science is any larger grouping that's sociology, anthropology, political, science, and decision science is management science, the cost, risk, and benefit analysis, that form of applied analysis, that applied mathematics that takes human behavior into, uh, in, into consideration, and with problems of this complexity and subtlety, you need them all. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the framing of the human dimensions that I believe came out of our session is that reducing risks and realizing the benefits of these technologies depends on people at the level of individuals, organizations, and, uh, and, and polities. 
the second, that relying on intuitions in designing and evaluating the systems that deal with these technologies, it's natural to rely on our in intuitions, but it's unfortunate because those intuitions are often wrong or, or, or imprecise. Third, that the biological research community faces a challenge of not having what some economists call the absorptive capacity for social science. That is, there is nobody on the inside who can tell when they have a social science problem, define it in terms that would be recognizable to a social scientist, and find somebody who, who will help them to work the problem. Um, that's on the demand side. On the supply side, the social science community may lack the incentives for, for addressing biological, uh, biological science issues because our incentive scheme is to publish on relatively narrow, narrow topics. I think we were, we were fortunate to have three distinct speakers today who have that bridge which requires them to draw on different social sciences as well as to see the value for the basic science in engaging applied problems. Uh, next slide, please. But what are the kinds of issues that you would find if you brought the social sciences to bear? One is to identify the places in which scientific judgment affects the prediction of, of outcomes. We have, many of the statements we've heard had to do with scientists anticipating how, how, how transmissible something would be. These are, if there, this is, given that this is a discovery process, there are likely to be surprises. So it's important to recognize that these are scientific judgments and do elicit them in the best, most accountable way possible. Second, that they're ethical judgments and analysis how you define them, who you share them with, where, what part, where the various polities or publics are engaged in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in the process. Third is the communication to and from stakeholders so that you can develop the technologies in the ways that's most sensitive to their needs and keep them properly appraised. Fourth problem, more from sociology or soci the social sciences, is the normalization of pathology and of virtue. We can get accustomed to best practices that are terrible by any any absolute standard, we just get used to them. And as thinking of, thinking of Ruth Ann's talk, you can also, and, and actually Barry's comments just, just now, there's the possibility of the normal, uh, normalization of virtue, that these are things that you just don't, don't do, and this is part of the kind of bottom up process of acculturation that Ruth Ann talked about. For, uh, one, two, three, four, Fifth, you can have a mismatch between the technology and the regulatory mechanism in terms of the not not just not just government regulation, but also the the societal controls that one has over it. You can have a have regulatory control mechanisms that don't have the requisite variety for a technology, and as Barry was saying, are moving very very quick very quickly. And we've developed our institutions for a different uh, for a, a different in, uh, environment. Environment and one can another problem that one runs into is in the neglect of opportunity costs. We know a lot about the technologies in which we've invested, and much less about the ones that don't, in which we haven't uh, invested. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to offer, in the spirit of Barry's two uh, personal comments, here are two suggestions uh, or recommendations. One is that given the difficulty of bridging the basic and the, the basic and apply the social sciences and the application areas, there's at least some value in, in centers that would serve as a kind of clearinghouse for helping interested biologists to find social scientists who can help them to work their problems and social scientists to 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 find the people with whom they're willing to work and maybe to help help us make the case to our de to department heads that this is a worthy worthy pursuit to spend say as much time as uh, as all three of our speakers have had working with uh, uh, with clients. And to, so that's to apply the social science that we have and then create the needed evidence for, for what some people call a, a adaptive management, that we don't know exactly where we're going and we're gonna, things are keep changing, we need to be on top of it. And second is to um, develop shadow alternative evaluation processes. That is, uh, if, if our current mechanisms are not up to it, we need alternative me mechanisms. And then we have principles, I think, uh, particularly from, uh, from Monica's talk, you saw all the expertise that we know. So you could bound the set of deliberative mechanisms whereby this might work, but we don't really know how they would work until you get people the different kinds of expertise, cultural experiences to, to get 
together and see how they, how they work. And one might hope that if you had some worked examples, maybe like, like some of the conventions that, uh, that, that people have, have talked to, that they would eventually just become the thing that people do. It's very hard to get people to repeal regulations that promise, promise safety, but sometimes they just atrophy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe they'll go away if we have something, uh, something better. Thank you. Baruch, thank you very, very much for those reflections. Uh, Phil, let me turn to you now, uh, a discussion about uh, some of the points of view raised by what we might call interested parties. Yes. So let us hear uh, your reflections on the discussion. Well, will do. Um, I guess the, the first of these uh, interested parties was uh, Michael Callahan, uh, who uh, pointed out that uh, the EU and the US are not the future epicenter and may not even be the present epicenter of gain of function research. And similarly, government funding may uh, not necessarily be the dominant uh, mode of funding uh, of this research as well. And we need to sort of expand our thoughts about how we might influence these processes. One, I think, very interesting point he raised were some case studies where uh, mechanisms of control of infectious uh, agents of concern um, was lost not due to any malintent, but often due to uh, necessities of uh, people operating under difficult circumstances uh, and similarly to the design of vaccines that may not be optimal for maintaining uh, 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 virologic sensitivity uh, were due to the necessities of trying to produce extremely inexpensive vaccines in developing countries. So there are mechanisms where consultative mechanisms might help where forms of assistance might help, and also where incentives need to be created, where we can incentivize people to uh, limit risks when we're not in a position to regulate. Uh, Robert Fisher uh, discussed uh, the, the conflict uh, there is at a regulatory level between the need to make for evidence-based decision-making, which is necessarily uh, time-consuming, uh, requires uh, evidence gathering, uh, which is rigorous, time-consuming, expensive, but there's also the need often to act quickly, uh, particularly in these emerging or uh, outbreak situations. And if this is an inherent conflict that has to be reconciled and our consideration of what we do around gain of function play into that. And in particular, coming back to a uh, consideration that, that came up earlier in the meeting that estimation of risk can really only be judged in the context of, of, of expected benefit. Without benefit, why would you take any risk? And so that, that these things play into the sorts of mechanisms that we might pursue to try to control the risks of gain-of-function research of concern. Uh, Jonathan Moreno did something that I really liked, and that was uh, try to identify where there are areas of consensus. And I don't know if everyone will agree on those areas of consensus, but I think some are close enough to, to uh, uh, bear mentioning. Um, there is consensus that there are times when one needs to move quickly. But there's also consensus that some regulation is needed. Uh, there is a consensus that biocontainment is imperfect, that risk mitigation uh, involves heavily uh, human factors and increasingly human factors as the mechanical and environmental factors get under better control. Uh, that would be desirable to have alternatives to risky experiments. And that gain of function uh, experiments are not fully predicted, but probably improving. There, he also had a, a uh, very interesting proposal for what he calls RBATs, and I do not recall exactly what RBAT uh, stands for, but the notion that there would be real-time, ongoing, interactive uh, evaluation of uh, uh, experiments of concern or experiments that may not yet be of concern but could venture into that area so that uh, an institution is not simply a checkpoint, for example, at the time of funding and another at the time of publication, but an ongoing interactive and cooperative process of, of interaction, which I thought was actually a very intriguing idea that might not take care of the whole issue, but I think could be a very solid of contributor. And then Ethan Septembri um, discussed uh, some of just the lessons of uh, the uh, first H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and then the H7N9 outbreak response in 2013. I think making the point that uh, although we think primarily of gain-of-function research as being long-term exploratory research, in fact, gain-of-function, not of concern, but gain-of-function is an inherent part of the routine business of, of uh, vaccine production, uh, and, and therefore those impacts have to be considered. 
I did want to raise just a couple of points from the uh, discussion uh, that followed. Um, the first was a question from uh, Gerald Epstein. Um, and uh, I was very tempted to just blurt out an answer if I felt in my role as moderator, I really shouldn't, but, but now I have the pulpit, so, 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 so I will answer it. And, and the question was, uh, what, is, what is sort of the evidence for benefit of gain of function for surveillance? It's been talked about benefit, for example, vaccine design, but what about surveillance? And you know, today, um, one of the things that gain of function can give you is sequence signatures of risk for, for example, high pathogenicity. Today, sequence analysis is a part of risk analysis and vaccine virus selection, but it is secondary at this point to phenotypic, clinical, and epidemiologic considerations. Uh, I do think, however, that that will start to shift over time. It is certainly never going to be the case that a sequence analysis can replace uh, epidemiologic, clinical, and phenotypic characterization. However, certainly the volume of sequence data that is relevant um, is likely to increase dramatically. Uh, it's now possible to sequence flu strains directly from harvested secretions. You don't need to grow the virus. The ability to do that sequencing is becoming increasingly widespread, and it, it's, it's really quite conceivable that these will be done in sort of handheld devices uh, in the coming decade. And there's likely to be an explosion of genetic sequence data coming in in real time that allow monitoring of epidemiologic events and I know of two major private efforts and at least one public effort to really apply bioinformatics to glean more information from, from uh, those data, primarily around antigenic change, but one could also do so around pathology. So I do think that even though sequence analysis, which can be informed by gain of function research, is a relatively small component of risk assessment today, is likely to increase over time. So, so that would be my answer to, to that question. The other one point I wanted to come up before just closing with some sort of personal observations is I thought another uh, very good point that was made during the discussion is an increasing need to consider integration of the multiple biosafety, biosecurity, and other regimens. And we have gain of function, we have DERC, we have select agent, we have routine biosafety, we have agricultural biosafety, and it is uh, sort of calling out, I think, for uh, at some point in the not so distant future, some sort of integration. So just to end with some, some personal comments, and I guess the first personal comment is also by way of disclosure. Uh, uh, this was a, a panel of, of interested parties, and I'm certainly an interested party. I'm, I'm currently Chief Scientific Officer for Viral Vaccine Development, uh, Research and Development at Pfizer, and before that I had a similar role at Novartis. So when I first heard about the, the Kaok and Fouché experiments, I had very mixed emotions. Um, uh, I, I mean, maybe, maybe the first one was sort of an expletive uh, 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 because uh, it wasn't because I wasn't interested. I, I really wanted to know what those experiments showed because there was information there that could be useful for knowing, you know, what is the threat of H5 actually spreading and what are the signatures? I, I, I did want to know. However, there was a thought that this could really blow back on the whole community in a very big way. Uh, and indeed, there was a decision, you know, as, a, as a, I guess a company man in some ways, why would one wallow into this, this field if you don't actually ever intend to do gain-of-function research of concern? And when you look at what those initial experiments were, they made some point mutations. And then they passaged the viruses and ferrets a bunch of times. We make point mutations. Now we do it to attenuate, not to increase virulence. We passage virus and infect ferrets all the time. This, the distinction between what was done there and what is routinely done to make vaccines is very different in the outcome. In one case, you're trying to increase pathogenicity. In another case, you're trying to attenuate. Yet the fundamental manipulations are not fundamentally different. And the instruments of policy to affect what is done are blunt instruments. And I saw a very high risk that in the attempt, uh, there, there was no dispute with the notion that, that we need to do something to mitigate big risk, not only because of the risk itself, whatever one thinks of that risk, there's certainly a perception risk. And certainly being part of a pharmaceutical company, I think most people in academics, most people assume that academic institutions are benign. We, we don't quite have that benefit, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, and and so, so the notion that you, you, not only can you not do things that are evil, but you don't want to do things that are perceived as evil, uh, and, you have to be, and, you, and you do have to make sure that the mechanisms are there, that people in the public also trust that you're not doing these sorts of things. It is important, and these things do need to be instituted. I think just the level of interest that we see is clear evidence that something has to be done. However, it's also very important that we not throw the baby out with the bathwater and not overly affect the, the large bulk of work 
done both experimentally and just in terms of medical countermeasure pr pr measure production is not unnecessarily inhibited so that, so that we actually come up with a net positive for this whole effort in terms of public safety. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, very much for your reflections as well as your summary of what was discussed at the uh, session. Uh, Ron, it's been a recurrent theme uh, about the question of governance and international uh, status of managing this problem. Your session faced that front and center. I'm eager to hear your reflections. It did, and, and what the session told me was that there is an international dimension to this entire debate about gain of function research and risks and benefits that cannot be ignored. We heard a number of possible ways of approaching that on an international scale. One was to go to a non-regulatory framework to take ethics or other sorts of systems that have gained traction and are accepted across the biomedical field, build on those and essentially build a culture of responsibility within the community that would assure the public that everyone was taking the appropriate, whatever that means, um, mitigation steps. Another was to simply accept that nations that were carrying out gain-of-function research would develop their own sets of regulatory <laughs> frameworks, like taking the recommendations of the NSADB, raising them to the level of US government policy, stop there. The other was to allow the efforts that are ongoing in areas like the United States and the EU to begin to cross-fertilize each other and bring together groups that would then allow for voluntary harmonization without going to an international organization like the WHO. And then the higher level was you go to a UN or a WHO and you try um, perhaps the impossible task we heard of coming up with a global regulatory scheme. Um, Gabrielle Lung suggested the middle ground would be the most effective, that um, nations begin talking, that either um, through national academies or through scientific organizations or other organizations, I'd suggest maybe for some nations, the OECD or bilateral agreements uh, where conversations go on with the attempt of harmonization. Now I'll give a personal though plea in here to the NSABB, and that is we've heard repeatedly that the gain of function experiments of concern represent a very narrow sphere out of all the experiments. And we've been given a, possibly a three axis sort of way of judging that. Personally, I'm still having trouble knowing what to place within that narrow sphere and whether uh, I, what I would place in there would be the same that you would place in there, uh, and particularly when we look across different nationalities and go to the international scale. The more the NSABB can do to really define the narrow scale. Now, the issue with that, as we've heard, it has to be adaptive, and, and as it, I started listening uh, to yesterday's discussions, it seemed like we were going to get there, that, that we were going to be able to agree upon an hour scale. As I kept hearing more and more discussion, particularly today, um, and what was going on in um, China and, and the industrial scale, it suddenly was getting broader with it. Boundaries were definitely not clear to me. So I think that's a challenge to the NSABB. Um, Second personal observation, I'm glad the Academy has not been asked in this case to develop a consensus, and I feel sorry for the NSABB that does have to <laughs> develop that uh, consensus. So um, I think um, the other point that came up in our session that's very important uh, that KG uh, rose, raised is if we're going to go to the international scale, what's the real issue that would bring people together? Well, what is it that, that we're trying to do or not do um, in this discussion. Now, I gave one um, answer to KG privately, and, and that was trying to prevent a global pandemic. And, and, and that may mean that the research is absolutely necessary because it will provide the vaccines, the surveillance, whatever, uh, to prevent the 
pandemic, or take the opposite side, that uh, the research itself is the real risk that something gets out and causes a pandemic. And therein is, in fact, the dilemma that we are facing with this entire debate. And um, I'm not sure that we're ever going to come up with an answer that's satisfactory to everybody. So again, I'm glad you're charged with consensus building, and I'm not. Thank you. Well, we would be satisfied if you formed a consensus in your own mind about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll have to talk to my other partner. We'll have to talk to your other partner. <laughs> but this has been a marvelous uh, summary, truly, and some very, very uh, cogent uh, remarks. Let me uh, invite now uh, any representatives from NIH, NSABB, if you would uh, care to offer uh, either a reflection, a request, or an observation, uh, we would welcome it at this point, and I'll just uh, go in order as you come to the, uh, to the microphone. Joseph, it looks like they're pointing to you up front. So I, I first want to thank Harvey and, and the academies for, for holding the session. I found it extremely valuable. I want to thank the panelists, all the speakers, and all the participants. I think all the feedback we've heard has been immensely helpful. Um, we obviously have, have uh, we want to provide some of our feedback to your feedback and also uh, highlight some additional things that we uh, still are tossing around in our, in our heads. So um, just some observations to begin with. First, I'm heartened in, in thinking that we don't have any major missteps, I think, at least to, to this point in time. I mean, we're not totally off on, a, on the wrong track, and clearly I'm pleased to hear that. I'm, another thing I'm pleased about, a, and that it's been implicit here, but not really explicitly mentioned, is we've moved away from a list-based system to a phenotypic system that I think has been called for uh, for a number of years uh, by the NSABB. So um, I, I think those are real positive aspects of, of where we're headed. Now, I'll speak personally. I heard a number of things that I personally would like to see added to our, to our report. Uh, and, and again, these are things that we have not yet deliberated on, and so I'm speaking just as an individual member. Um, these include incident reporting mechanisms, a call for incident reporting. Obviously, the risk-benefit uh, assessment highlighted the paucity of data around incidents, and, and I think that kind of a, a data would be immensely valuable to us. Clearly, a need for harmonization, both on the national level as, on, as well as on the international level. That's a theme that we've heard time and again, and I think something that we probably should call for more explicitly in our, in our final uh, report. Uh, a concept that had came up today a number of times that I personally like uh, is this concept of a code of conduct, uh, a code of ethics, if you will, for scientists to engage in this type of research, and I certainly would love to see us make a recommendation in that realm. And then uh, finally, the, again, how to evolve the international uh, component of this problem, I think, is, is something that we still we, we will be struggling with. I, I, I like the way Jerry phrased it earlier this morning, though. I think uh, I'm thinking about this myself as a as a step in a process, and clearly, uh, I think more work needs to be done after we finish our our, our task. So, um, again, I think uh, po uh, international engagement is something that we yet need to do more much more completely, and I, but I would not want to wait for that before we issue recommendations. Again, personal feeling. So I'm going to bring us back full circle. The first session, we, uh, you know, Sam gave the, um, the, uh, basically the summary of our approach and our findings to date and recommendations. And one of the first questions that we really asked about was this idea about the three phenotypes that we've, uh, that we've mentioned in our report. And I want to come back to this because, again, I think in the original language, we gave as an example uh, resistance to countermeasures, and it was really intended to be only an example. Unfortunately, it seems to be the, the one piece about phenotype three that folks have really get, you know, grabbed onto. And I just want to, again, remind folks that for me, and I think for men, most of the committee, that 
that third phenotype is what makes this a, a, an issue of pandemic potential. I think uh, traits one and two really go to the animal pathogen interface, and trait three is really where you talk about the human public health, the societal aspects of pandemic. And, and I think that third trait remains critical in, in my own opinion. Now, whether we can revise the language in a way that is more palatable, but I just conceptually, I think that third, that third phenotype is really about pandemic potential. Uh, so I, again, we would love more feedback on that question, and I know that my colleagues have other things they'd like additional feedback on. So I'll stop here. Maybe, we, uh, maybe if we should just put our issues on the table, and then is that exactly that fine? Okay. That would be very good. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to get back to uh, oversight design for a second uh, to bounce two ideas off of you and uh, the audience. It's crystallized again by that figure that sadly you didn't have ahead of time, but perhaps you recall the flow chart that we're playing with in order to visually communicate the oversight we're envisioning. So I have a question or thought at the institutional level and at the federal level. Uh, somebody usefully used the term on-ramp. What's the on-ramp for this? Who says, hey, we've got one of these? And what's envisioned uh, so far is that the PI and local oversight authorities, which would include IBC presumably, are an on-ramp. They may say, we see it. And of course, then the IBC particularly be involved if there's agreement that it's there in ongoing management prospectively if the protocol is funded. Uh, if they fail to spot it, it may be spotted at the federal level. Uh, the idea is that it would go through uh, scientific merit review, and then if it survived that, there would be again another look. One of my concerns about this at the institutional level, and particularly hearing some of the thoughtful comments that we've gotten, is that we're in danger of recapitulating in IBCs the history of IRBs, a 40-year history of being very slow to really design, much less effectuate, a kind of learning oversight system where we were systematically and probably still don't adequately, systematically looking across IRBs, harvesting in a way that a de-identified way that's shareable with other IRBs, what the conclusions were on what basis, and spotting unjustified variation. We all know that situating IRBs locally and IBCs is in part meant to be responsive to local conditions and local ethics, but you reach the point of unjustified variation. So I am uh, thinking about how do we, uh, how does NSAB move the ball forward so that we don't recapitulate that history, so that we learn from the IRB experience, albeit with a different set of issues and human subjects, et cetera, but it's still local oversight. And I think there is a huge opportunity because now we do have an empirical literature. IOM has gone at this over and over again. And now we have the notice of proposed rulemaking and that whole effort at HHS and other agencies. So, Local review is one set of concerns I have, really making that state of the art and making that an effective on-ramp. The other concern I have is at the federal level, that loop out to the right. So now you've triggered. You've gone the on-ramp. You've got Goffrock. Who looks at it at the federal level? Post-merit review. And I just want to circle back and see whether we can end up harvesting your wisdom on this idea that perhaps it should not just be an intramural governmental process, but it should also be a Federal Advisory Committee Act process. Sure, there are going to be circumstances where uh, you can't review a protocol in full view because of the biosecurity concerns. But there are exceptions in the Federal Advisory Committee Act, as you know, for proprietary information, et cetera. And in any case, NSAB is being asked for its recommendation of how the federal government should design this review. But when you look at the seven principles that the current draft urges 
uh, the federal authority, whoever it is, to consider. Those seven principles include the ethical acceptability of the protocol, whether in fact the prospective benefits are, uh, justify the risks. These are considerations that I just as an individual find it hard to imagine the public trusting if there were no public visibility, no public input, no you know, required on the record. So those are my two uh, pressure points where further input would really be wonderful, the local review and the federal review design. Thank you very, very much. And uh, additional comment. Yeah, this is Lou Hamash, I'm also an NSAB member, and I actually had, um, had some of the same uh, um, questions about the, the value of, a, of a, a federal advisory committee akin to the RAC that was obviously put in place for the recombinant DNA issues, and I think over the years have, have, have really been adaptive and functioned in many different capacities and certainly have achieved the public engagement that we are all seeking. But I, I, I had another question I wanted to bring up, and that's that issue of that as, as our recommendations currently stand, they only really uh, capture things that go through federal funding mechanism. And we all know that there are more and more uh, university money that there's startup money, for example, so the projects can get started before funding is even seeked. If you have a, a young investigator, they typically have very big startup <coughs> packages. You also have more and more industrial interest in university research. And of course, there's the whole private sector that will not be captured by any of these recommendations. It seems that if you're talking about potential pandemic risk, that uh, maybe we are, we are not doing our job if you at least not, don't deal with that part of, of the equation. So I'm just wondering what, what, what your uh, insight and, and, and kind of uh, um, view on that might be. Thank you. Uh, we, well, we've had a number of uh, very concrete topics. And excuse me, I didn't mean to uh, not recognize you yeah, on this side. Uh, I'm Jim LaDuke, uh, also an NSABB member. I'm the, the director of the Galveston National Laboratory at the University of Texas uh, Medical Branch. This is a, a biocontainment lab that uh, has all levels of biocontainment up through and including VL4. So uh, I'm especially interested in the issue of risk mitigation. Going back to Ron's comment, at the end of the day, our goal is to prevent a pandemic. Um, we've talked a lot about risk mitigation and clearly, many of the threats that were identified can be mitigated through biocontainment and all. So my question to the panel uh, is, how do we create a foundation upon which a policy can be built that clearly articulates the requirements for biosafety and biosecurity, and importantly, a culture of responsibility that spans the scope from the individual scientists clear through the institutional leadership and how to realizing that all each experiment is going to be different, the requirements for each experiment are going to vary. We don't want to be perspective, prospective or perspective that uh, requiring uh, very specific guidelines. On the other hand, I think we need to pay close attention to, to the conditions under which this work is done, both nationally and clearly internationally. Thank you, Thank, thank you very much. A, a number of the uh, comments had to do with uh, issues, especially the, our last two speakers, with issues around institutional and the research community responsibility over and above uh, pure federal funding and over and above, frankly, even just narrowly defined gain of function research, if I may, uh, may suggest. And so uh, one of the uh, topics uh, that has been raised is uh, the question of how to generate, how to engender, how to support uh, this broader and deeper culture of awareness and safety that will help mitigate risk. So that is uh, one theme. I think another that uh, we heard is still uh, help around thinking critically and in a circumscribed fashion about what is it that qualifies for attention in the first place as potentially uh, deserving of some special consideration that's separate but uh, importantly uh, goes along with what ought to be the criteria 
for deciding what then actually happens. And separate again, but related, is the set of questions that have been raised around who decides. How is the participation and at what levels, uh, both within the government processes and around it? So all of these uh, questions are still with us, uh, uh, not fully uh, resolved, but certainly commented upon. But now we have an opportunity for those who are here and also uh, any uh, who are on the stage to offer their personal reflections on these uh, additional specific points. Would anyone well, like yeah. to start, please? Can I, right. can I start? Um, I want to react to the question of the IBC versus the national and, and um, suggest that we learned an awful lot with the RAC in the early days. Um, we basically sent cases to the full national board until we were able to demonstrate to the local IBCs what was of greater concern, what wasn't of greater concern. We refined the principles there. And in some ways, if, you know, we need to do the same thing here. And it becomes a learning process, a reiterative process, um, where there's appropriate consultation from the national back to the local. And eventually, the local learns how to handle some things. And you lessen the burden on the national board. The other thing was we had exactly the same question with the RAC, where it involved federal funding and did not impose regulatory authority over the private sector or the non-federal government. There was fear that that meant they would escape from the uh, framework and, and would do bad things. In reality, the first cases that came to the RAC came from industry. They wanted the national approval. They didn't want to go around the system. They wanted to become part of the system, even though they weren't mandated to do so. I have no reason to think the same thing would not happen here, that um, either for liability or otherwise, that individual companies or those not forced to join the system would ask to join the system. Now, it's just a personal view, but it does have a historical base, and the same questions were rampant at that point. You know, I, I can certainly speak from having been in companies. Um, when there are national standards and accepted standards, even when not required to file them, in general, they, we, companies want to do so. And in fact, what is the, the most distressing situations are those where you have lack of clarity over what the expectations are. And that's why these notions of advisory boards and groups you can turn to to ascertain what those standards are, even if, even if compliance is voluntary, are useful, and I think you would find a widespread a desire to, to meet those standards. Thank you. Uh, one comment that I, I would add uh, is we've had a lot of discussion about the importance of the scientific community building and reinforcing a culture of safety. And that's, uh, of course, central and critical going forward. We also had, I thought, a very informative and stimulating session on the importance and practicality of public engagement and the various types of publics. And it does seem to me that in the thinking of NSABB going forward, that a model that incorporates at an appropriate level, including a FACA-like uh, model, uh, relevant public participation would be very salutary in building the kind of larger trust and frankly reinforcing the community of safety, both within and around the scientific community, that the success ultimately will depend. Uh, so I, putting together a variety of the things we've heard, believe that that would be a valuable addition in the thinking of uh, FACA going forward and in connection with the NSABB. Other comments or reflections? Uh, this last discussion has reminded me of uh, a process I was involved with at, at FDA over the last, last few years, in which FDA, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, has developed a benefit-risk framework. You can find, find it online that it developed jointly with its staff 
came up with, uh, has rewritten its, uh, the guidance to the advisory committee for summarizing in information that leads to a table that looks much like the table that Kara uh, Morgan's uh, third option that was designed to, to um, help people to tell their story in a way that could be, that one could see what the logic was, one could compare across, uh, across decisions, one could find the decisions that were, uh, as somebody said, uh, said were, were anomalous, that gave industry a more uh, reasonable, more, a clearer target for the kind of things that FDA was, was approving and they were comprehensible, and, well, at the same time, able to, to protect what there was proprietary, uh, proprietary in, information. So there's something that, you know, something that had those properties of enabling people to get their hands, or, hands around, uh, get their minds uh, around the basis for, for the decision could be a contributor to this process. I might make another observation, if I, if I may, on this uh, first and fundamental question of the phenotypic uh, inclusiveness or exclusiveness. One of the themes that I heard repeatedly uh, in the course of the discussion is the importance of circumscribing the domain of concern so that neither the scientific community nor the regulatory authority nor frankly the interested publics are needlessly burdened with a wide variety of questions that truly do not raise and rise to a level of concern. At the same time, we had a lot of discussion as to whether the current formulation where the requirement is that a given experiment affect all of the elements uh, is a sufficient degree of circumscription. Uh, now, uh, I think the real challenge for the NSABB is to reflect in its description the actual intent of the NSABB and to do it in a way that is clear and understandable over time. So for example, uh, and I will speak again for myself, uh, I think we can be overly fixed on the models that depend on our familiarity with influenza and influenza as the case, when in fact the policy that will be promulgated ultimately needs to be capable of dealing with gain of function and increasingly, I would say, experiments that intend to develop entirely novel organisms with capacities and capabilities that are not currently even expressed in existing microorganisms. And if you think that broadly, defining a phenotypic space that involves virulence and involves transmissibility and involves resistance to treatment, if that's how you wish to characterize it, you could in imaginably place any organism at a point in space that has those three attributes defined. And if you think of it that way, there's an aspect of this space where you would not want research to go at all. There's an aspect of that space where you wouldn't want to require further review and then there's an aspect of that space, depending on your starting point and the direction of the experiment, and this is where vaccine development comes in so importantly, the direction of the experiment to make it worse or to make it better, which would dictate that it may then be a topic that requires uh, consideration for gain of function. And I hope that it will be possible for NSABB to mull this question further to think about ways to characterize and describe exactly what it believes should determine a consideration for gain of function, perhaps to be explicit about excluding vaccine development research, which is so fundamental to protection and actually the contrary to the worry, uh, and to be able to apply the principles more generally as new ideas with different organisms will naturally arise uh, in the creative minds of science. Joseph, the floor Joe, is yours. Joe Canabracchi, NSABB. So uh, we agree, uh, in short. Uh, I, I just again want to clarify that what, you know, I think Ken Burns said it best yesterday, it's we're not really worried about what goes in, it's really what comes out. And, and 
We, we are not saying that the experiments of concern are only those that contribute the three phenotypes. What we're saying is uh, the experiments of concern are those that result in, a, in an organism that displays those three phenotypes. And there's a difference. Uh, because you could begin with both two of the three and contribute the third and you're in the game. So, so again, I, I, I think we agree in concept, it's just a matter of choosing our words carefully, yeah. uh, in my opinion. That's very helpful and uh, I think it speaks to uh, a need even for uh, further clarity in, the, in this description. Uh, let me invite, uh, if there are any further reflections that any of the panelists would uh, care to offer? Is there any point that anyone has felt as a burning need to contribute that uh, you would like to add to the record before we conclude so as to benefit the NSABB as much as we can? We'll start here and then we'll come over. Please. Wendy Hall, Homeland Security. My question was more in terms of precedent. One, how important is it that you all as an academic body have full awareness of the gain of function experiments being proposed throughout a bunch of different labs in the United States? Because right now the people with the visibility are the government funders, but I'm not sure there's clarity across the academic community at any one point in time of who's planning to do what or who's doing what. And my second question is with the select agent rules and the um, way they were implemented in a range of 300 labs, we saw a range of performance. And some labs were the gold standard, and they came to us and complained about other labs that were a little bit lax, and they were worried about liability. If some lab does it bad, it's going to have a bad impact on the whole community. So there was a range, as one would expect for any system with 300 components. In gain of function research, is there any precedent where if the academic community themselves had full visibility, peer-to-peer, institution-to-institution, that there could be corrective elements from the institutional bodies with each other to redirect or course correct sort of the lower, uh, more sloppy practice in gain of function mm -hmm. research, such that the government has to, doesn't have to come down with really tough restrictive language across the board in case one or two, you know, make a sloppy enough error that it makes the mainstream press and everybody else. Thank you, uh, Wendy, for both the comment and really a, a suggestion. I think it emphasizes, it reinforces the importance of the scientific community itself coming together in a coherent way on this and related issues of uh, safety and security. And from a personal point of view, I don't think the government alone can accomplish this. And I don't think the community acting without the guidance of shared standards will be able to do it nearly as well. So I think they will be mutually reinforcing. Let me come over here. Um, Monica Shaksvana with the UPMC Center for Health Security. I know we're sort of in a regulatory, let's prevent bad things from happening mindset. But I wonder if, if we could pick up a point that Mark Lipsitch meant around the capacity for innovation. Are there things that could incentivize, not, not, not simply in your proposal where you say, well, I, I can't do it any other way, and you have to, you have to provide the rationale for uh, potentially uh, conducting a, a, a goth rock um, experiment. Is there, and perhaps this is out there already, are there special research uh, finances for offering incentive to find a different way? I think we have to think about um, fostering innovation, not just pushing, holding back the bad stuff, but incentivizing new ways of thinking about this. If, if there are these systems that are put in place, and there is data gathered about the kinds of experiments that get the thumbs down. That data at least could be synthesized to say, okay, you know, this, this line of research really needs to be replaced with something safer. Let's incentivize from a financing point of view, you know, funds via NIH, et cetera, innovation. So, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Please. Nicholas Evans from the University of Pennsylvania. I have uh, two what I consider erratum and then three quick points. Uh, the first is regarding the Declaration of Helsinki. The point is well taken that the Declaration of Helsinki was a great initial work in establishing uh, norms in human subjects research and biomedical <laughs> ethics. Uh, 
but it is worth noting that the FDA's removal of the Declaration of Helsinki from its regulations is an indicator that as a model for governing the life sciences, we should be especially careful about the way that we seek this type of international collaboration, because if the US is going to set up or attempt to initiate other um, setups for governing gain-of-function research only to pull out of them because it doesn't want dynamic reference in its own legislation, that's a huge problem. Um, the second is, and this is uh, based on the comments of my colleague Mark Lipsitch, um, the critique that IRBs and biomedical ethics uh, um, chills biomedical research has definitely been made again and again and again and again in the literature. And two recent works on that include uh, Carl Schneider's The Census Hand and Robert Klitzman's The Ethics Police. Um, now my comments quickly. We seem to be living in a bit of an acronym soup at the moment um, regarding GOF and GOF rock and GOFOC and GOFA and everything else. Um, and we might need to distinguish that. I think this is really important conceptually that there is gain of function, which everybody believes that as a technique is a valuable technique for a lot of reasons. Then there is gain of research, gain of function research resulting in the creation of novel pandemic pathogens that is beneficial. And then there is that the same kind of research that is uniquely beneficial. And Griffin Scientific's tables on the unique benefits of these kinds of research said that three of 13 coronavirus studies that they looked at were uniquely beneficial, and nine of 24 influenza gain of function studies were uniquely beneficial. So we should really be careful to specify exactly what we're talking about here. Um, I've noted that the consultation of healthcare workers, if we're talking about engagement, is almost entirely absent from this discussion. I'm not simply talking about MDs, but EMTs, RNs, NPs, the people who, pre who bear the disproportionate burden of risk in the event of an infectious disease outbreak. So when we're talking about what benefits we might want from scientific research, we should really, I think, be consulting with the people who are going to actually use those interventions uh, in their day-to-day day -day work of actually saving lives. Um, finally, on innovation, um, it occurs to me that if we're going to, over the last uh, kind of half decade, spend $820 million on synthetic biology funding, we might want to also spend some, a small amount of money of, uh, in innovating in our applied biosafety. I mean, this is, should be an area for innovation, not just in terms of social science and human factors, but the actual physical technologies, so reinvest in material science to better our PPE. This is not only great research, but it would also be robust solutions for gain of function, for laboratory acquired infections and for disease pandemics. Um, and finally, in terms of social sciences, I absolutely agree that social sciences should be incentivized, as it was put, uh, to participate in issues around biology, but would note that part of that comes down to cash um, and the funding of social sciences research, which has historically been dismissed for its values. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I bring uh, two questions from the web that due to time yesterday couldn't be asked, but I wanted them to be on the record. Um, the first is from uh, Grigory Kamula. Do current oversight frameworks provide adequate treatment of novel pathogens that were never seen before and are not on the pathogen lists mentioned in the draft recommendations? For example, if a new potentially pandemic pathogen like MERS is identified, would gain-of-function research with this pathogen fall under proposed regulation? And the second question is from uh, John Kadvani. Uh, it's directed at Dr. Crescarande. Uh, prompted by publications suggesting that gain-of-function research has characteristics of so-called potential quote-unquote normal accidents, those in which a technology combines highly negative outcomes like a nuclear plant meltdown with unquantified and perhaps unquantifiable scenarios falling outside even the most complete probabilistic risk analysis. Griffin's work suggests that such scenarios may be relevant with pandemic risk, the extreme negative outcome. Does Dr. Casagrande have an opinion on this characterization of gain-of-function research? Is it correct in some respects, as it may be for some contemporary technologies? Or may there be a characterization fueling clashing of gain-of-function risk perceptions? Great. Thank you for both of those. Uh, I think the first question really relates very directly to how NSABB will come to define what is meant by the, the research that falls under gain of function. And the second certainly uh, bears directly on the issues about the definition of application of risk and benefit analyses in these uh, uh, assessments. 
Well, let's go to the next comment, please. Rocco Casagrande, Griffin Scientific. I'm actually commenting not in my capacity as the PI of the Risk and Benefit Assessment. I wanted to uh, push back a little bit about several comments I heard this in the last couple days about what we can learn from the successes of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, I'd like to turn that argument on its head because insofar as there have been successes in biological nonproliferation, uh, such as the limited use of biological agents in warfare, I think those could be, if they have to be ascribed to a political instrument, maybe the Geneva Protocol is the better exemplar there that banned uh, first use of bacteriological warfare. Uh, whereas the way the Biological Weapons Convention was additive and unique was that it prohibited activities up to warfare, such as stockpiling and research, uh, that were offensive. And I think in that case, we've seen the Biological Weapons Convention as a spectacular failure in that several states' parties have violated it, including one of its depositories. So I think what we can learn is not from its successes, but from its failures, such as a lack of a uh, verification and inspection regime that has teeth and a lack of an enforcement capability uh, that's relevant internationally. And I think both of those can be used to draw lessons for our discussion today. Thank you very much. Please. Michael Selgalid, Center for Human Bioethics, Monash University. Just a small, but I think an important point. So some risks of gain-of-function research, we might be able to do a reasonable job of you know, predicting and or assessing some benefits potential benefits of gain-of-function research, we might be able to do a fairly reasonable job of predicting and or assessing. The important point was made today, and we were, were, <clears throat> we were reminded a bit in the summary at, at the beginning of the session that there are some benefits that are very hard to predict and or assess, and, and therefore, you know, value or predict. So that's a good point, but let's not let that bias, bias us uh, with the assumption that, oh, any given uh, gain of function research project, we should assume that it has some benefits that we're not taking into account because they're hard to value and predict and so on. Because the same is true of, of risks. Because we're talking about you know, epistemic benefits that are hard to predict and assess. Well, there can be epistemic risks that are hard to predict and assess. So it works in both ways. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Lipsitch. Um, there's been a lot of talk, uh, especially in the coffee breaks, about what are the things that we all agree, are there any experiments we all agree would never be acceptable, and are there any experiments that we all agree we should never impede, or any activities we should never impede? I don't know whether Ebola plus flu is in the first category of never acceptable. It was one of the examples people gave. Certainly, I think, does it, ex experiments, developments, uh, other work to enhance vaccine yield in uh, PR8 or some other safe background is the sort of thing we would never want to impede and, uh, and should be a green line if the other is a red line. So whatever the regulatory framework or, or, or oversight framework that's developed, I think it would be incredibly helpful to have at least those two kinds of border cases mm -hmm. spelled out by some examples in order to build our intuition for the next time something comes up that, that isn't envisioned yet. And then maybe to give some more contestable case studies, so some things that should never enter the on-ramp, some things that should never be allowed to progress if there are such things, and some things in the middle that should be reviewed and what should be the questions asked. Should there be a, a standard question asked, could this be done in PR8 background or some other safe background um, to get similar knowledge? The same way that we do, for example, on animal protocols. We have to explain why we're doing it in animals and what, what is unique about that. Maybe there are other questions, but, but a set of case studies that say this is okay, and should not be impeded, this is, not, if not allowable, and then some guidance for how to handle the middle ones, which we may not agree on. Thank you. Uh, Joe Canabrocki, NSABB. I just wanted to respond to that. Um, uh, 
when we had a number of calls where we tried to think of experiments that absolutely should not be done. And quite honestly, every single example that came up was, a, was a, an experiment that lacked scientific merit. And, and so I, I would just leave it there and let you think about that, but I, I, I really struggle to think of uh, experiments that have scientific merit that shouldn't be done. Uh, again, that's my personal view. And those that shouldn't be done are typically those that do not have scientific merit. So again, I'm just sharing you, with you some of our experience on, on our thinking about that issue. Thank you very much. Please. Jerry Epstein, DHS. Uh, just on the same topic, I think it's useful to go back to the HHS framework that Larry Kerr described yesterday and the test that a proposed project would have to satisfy before it was deemed acceptable for funding. One was that the pathogen to be constructed had some ability, and I'm not quoting this exactly, but there was some natural process by which that pathogen could occur. Therefore, you were creating something which you had a reasonable expectation nature might beat you to. And I think something that might pass the bar of not being acceptable, at least under that rule, if it were taken over here, is something where we might learn some science by building some construct and saying, does it work and how does it behave? But if it's not something nature might ever do on its own, you can't argue you're defending yourself from nature because nature wasn't going to get there. So that might be an example of something on the other side of the line, at least from the precedent of the HHS existing framework. Thank you very much for that addition. Any further comments? If not, I would just like to say that uh, we first want to express our deep appreciation to the several dozen participants who spoke and shared their views with us. Uh, I want to thank also the dozens of members of the uh, audience who are here and the several uh, on the web who participated and contributed uh, their ideas. Truly, uh, our admiration and appreciation for the work of the NSABB and its uh, colleagues at the NIH in trying to come to grips with these complicated questions is perhaps matched only by our wonderment and uh, admiration, uh, Volker, for the work that you and your colleagues have done in Europe to actually complete a phase of assessment and a coherent set of policies and strategies that now uh, apply in the European context. Uh, this uh, points to the very great challenge of harmonization within a country such as uh, the U.S. now, but also across the, the globe. Clearly, a policy about gain of function that applies only to one country is not a policy that will work for the safety of the world. And uh, that is something that we have to be very, very mindful of. I think it's also evident from all of the discussion that whatever is the next iteration of conclusions and recommendations that emerge from the NSABB will really be one step in a process that is likely to continue, require continued refinement, require the engagement of the scientific community, require creative ways of finding the public interested and affected to be involved and uh, creatively engaged in the process of decision making uh, going forward. I want to express personally my sincere and very deep appreciation to the members of our planning committee, uh, some of whom are here on stage, also Don Burke who's here, uh, a few who uh, are not uh, otherwise recognized include uh, Ruth Berkelman and uh, Sir John Scale uh, who did a wonderful job in helping to think through the organization of topics that would be most revealing. And I want especially to uh, call out and uh, express all of our appreciation to the exceptional staff of the Board of Life Sciences at the National Academies, including Joe Husbands, Fran Sharples, Annika Sen, Jenna Ogilvie, Brendan McGovern, Robin Winter, Andrea Hodgson, and Audrey Tevenon who did such a marvelous job in helping us prepare and enabling us to have such a fruitful and enjoyable experience over these two days. Thank you all very much for participating. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.